Please welcome Dropbox Vice President of Product and Growth, Adam Nash. Uh, hey everyone, um, I appreciate that applause. Um, I realize this is a dangerous time slot. Uh, we're after lunch, everyone's getting a little drowsy here and I have bad news for you. There's so many great speakers here today and at best, kind of like my Twitter profile says, I'm slightly amusing, just a little bit. So if you hear anything that resembles a joke, just kind of lean into it, laugh anyway. It's okay if it's like a pity laugh, pity's fine, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> But no, seriously, I'm talking about something very important to me today, um, which is I hope that in about half an hour I can encourage some of you to really take upon the mantle of trying to be a great product leader. Uh, product leadership is something I believe deeply in. It's something I've dedicated most of my career to. And I wanted to share a few insights I've gotten along the way in terms of how you could be a better product leader. Um, I always like to start with a leadership quote. Um, the problem is it's 2019 and it's very hard to find a leader that everyone universally looks up to. And so I've decided to go with a fictional alien robot who's about 25 feet tall, but always knows the right thing to say. Uh, no, in, in all seriousness, um, there is an Optimus Prime quote for everything. It's something I believe. Uh, <laughs> but this, uh, this talk actually began with a private session I gave when I left LinkedIn. I'd come from eBay, spent years there building product, um, spent a lot of time at the early days of LinkedIn, stayed through the IPO, and there was a tradition back then to give a last lecture when you left the company. And so that's how this talk began, capturing lessons in product from Web 1.0, Web 2.0, et cetera, and I've extended along the way. And so I always have this feeling when you move from one thing to the next, uh, a little bit of the difference between being a hero and being a memory. Um, but the real start of this talk began with a conversation I had with Reid Hoffman. Um, you may or may not know, founder of LinkedIn, is now a venture capitalist on the board of Microsoft. But back in 2007, we met at a Hobie's down in Mountain View, and believe me, it was not the best Hobie's. Um, but we were talking about Web 2.0 and the internet and the role of product. And it was supposed to be a one-hour breakfast. It turned into a four-hour discussion about the role of product in the future of the web, which we were trying to build. Um, and so this really cemented for me. At the time, there was a lot of debate about the role of product. Agile was new. People were saying, well, listen, if you have engineers and they're listening to customers, they can just respond to customers, build the features, iterate, learn, look at the data. Why do you need product leadership at all? Um, and as it turned out, both Reed and I agreed that actually there was a role for product to play. Um, and so that's how this started, and it, it became a theme. Um, but these are the top lessons. Since I only have about 25 minutes, I'm gonna cover six of the top lessons. For anyone who's interested in more of these, you can see older versions of this deck online. Um, let's start with the first one and the most controversial. Um, are there any engineers in the audience here? A few? All right, you are not gonna like this part. I'm just warning you right up front. So I'm really sorry, and it's because I started my career as a software engineer, and so deep down I know what every software engineer wants. And what they want is a clear ranking of all the different feature ideas, one through N, so you can draw the line, and that's what you're going to do, right? Um, I, I know you want it. I wanted it too. I wanted it in my software engineering career. I actually wanted it as a designer. I wanted it as a product manager. And then somewhere around 2009, I gave up on this because I now believe that that is a fatally flawed approach. And I will argue now that you need at least three buckets to put features in. And those three buckets are metrics movers, customer requests, and delight features. Let me walk you through it. Um, now, in the terms of metrics movers, we all know these features. These are the features that pay the bills, right? There's some number you want to move. Maybe it's revenue, maybe it's engagement, maybe it's growth. But these are projects and not features that you do to move some number. And in theory, those numbers should tie to the success of your business. Um, I'm not going to say that if you don't have numbers that tie to the success of the business, you're doing it wrong. Okay, I'm going to say that. You're doing it wrong. You should have numbers that tie to the success of your business. Um, most of the features you end up prioritizing end up being metrics movers. And that's not an accident. It turns out building software is hard. Building companies is hard. Growing companies is hard. And so as a result, you end up spending most of your time trying to move parts of your business. Um, the problem with doing metrics movers, if you do this well, is that while you will move your business, my experience is that there's a lot of smart people in software, talented designers, talented engineers, talented marketers. Um, if you focus on the problem of how to move your business forward, you usually will. But that 
will not build a great relationship with your customers by itself. And that is what led me to this breakdown of feeling that we need another bucket. Um, back in the early days, I worked at eBay. I have never worked at another company that was more metrics oriented than eBay back in the day. And eBay is a great company, and eBay successfully moved their numbers forward quarter after quarter after quarter. But problems started originating in the community after these years. And that problem is because we didn't have a separate bucket for customer requests. And that's the second bucket that I advocate for. Customer requests are what your customers want from you. They're using your software, they're putting their, their business, their livelihood in your software in some ways, and they have ideas and things that they feel like they need to move their business forward, um, and so they request them from you all the time. Um, now we have social media. You get customer requests everywhere from everyone. Um, I, feel, I feel sometimes customer requests from Christy Teigen, as it turns out. Um, anything can happen, um, but fundamentally, um, the problem with customer requests is it's often very hard to draw a line between a customer request and a metric that moves your business. Now, we all are human, so you probably empathize with this idea. Um, when you give advice to someone and they don't listen to you, how do you feel about that person? You don't like them that much. Um, it's a little bit ego, but when we give advice to people, we expect them to listen, especially if we're in some sort of relationship. Um, your customers feel the same way about you. If you develop a regular pattern where customers are making requests and you don't prioritize making some of those changes, not surprisingly, they won't like you very much after a while. Now let me ask you another question. What happens if you give advice to someone, they don't listen to you, and then they turn out to be really successful? What do you think of that person? Yeah, you hate them. I hate them a lot. And that can happen, and I've seen it happen to multiple good companies. They do such a good job moving their business forward. They're good on growth, they're good on engagement, they're good on revenue, and they succeed, but their customers start working against them. They start having conspiracy theories, ideas that they must be faking their numbers, they must be not doing this, because of course every good company listens to their customers to be successful. And so I'm a big believer that if you don't have a separate bucket of features where you have a regular cadence, of every month, every quarter, delivering on the top requests from your customers, you will have a problem with your customers, even if you're already moving your business forward. So now this is good news, right? So if you have metrics movers and you have customer requests, you will build a business that not only is moving up and to the right, which of course everyone likes, um, and not only will your customers like you. So what's the problem? The problem is your customers will like you, but they won't love you. It won't have that irrational relationship that you really want. And you might be saying, why do you want that irrational relationship? The answer is, you may not need it in the short term, but eventually one of your competitors will establish that relationship, and then you're in trouble. I um, mean, I say this as someone who brought, began their career at Apple, who's famous for this, their irrational relationship with their customers. It is very frustrating to compete, and even harder to win, against a competitor that has that irrational love for their competitors. And that's why I have a third bucket for delight features. Now, being from Apple, I, I use the Apple definition of delight. This has evolved over the years, but some of you may have seen this. Tim Cook does a lot of interviews. About five years ago, he was doing an interview with Kara Swisher at Recode, um, and she was pushing him for something like, What's, when's the Apple TV coming out or the car, or some product they haven't announced. So of course, Apple never pre-announces anything. And she said, well, why? Why don't you announce it? And Tim gave the best answer about what delight's about. He said, you know, at Apple, we actually believe that customers actually value surprise. And there's a truth to that. The key indicator of delight in my book are features that actually surprise people. People want to believe in this myth. I don't want to say a myth, it's partially true, but they want to believe that there are teams of amazing people who are brilliant and smart and inspired, great at technology, at design, at marketing, and they come up with things where once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's amazing. You want to show someone else, but part of that magic is the surprise. They didn't see it coming. And that builds that myth, that relationship, that trust that you can trust this company to keep coming up with amazing things that we didn't think of. And that's why if you don't have a regular cadence of delivering delight to your customers, I believe eventually you'll lose out to competitors that do. So whenever I talk about this, and I apologize again to the folks in the audience who really want that one list, I get like, Adam, I get it, there's three different things, but I could just apply a weighted factor to each of those three characteristics and then condense it and rank it zero to one and I can do it back again in the spreadsheet. 
It's not going to work. It's just, I, I hate to break the news. After 20 years, uh, I just haven't seen it happen. It is very rare for a customer request to actually be the type of feature that moves the numbers directly. Um, and the num features that move numbers directly are rarely things that people are requesting. Um, and they certainly don't delight people, usually. And delight features, by definition, are surprise. Right? So they're not going to be customer requests. Anything that customer requests are coming through the channel are probably being repeated dozens and dozens of times in the field. And so it doesn't hit the delight bar. And so really, I highly recommend that product teams, cross-functional product teams, maintain this idea of three buckets. If you run an agile process, think about it. Have you done anything to delight your customers this quarter? If not, the next sprint should. If you haven't done a customer request, you don't have a list of the top customer requests that you're constantly looking at, you should have this list. If you try to make one uniform list of prioritized features, eventually you're going to file prey to the same thing that hit a lot of early web companies, which is you'll end up only prioritizing metrics movers, and eventually your relationship with your customers will suffer and your competitive position will suffer. All right, we'll get to more fun stuff. Um, heat. Um, I love Silicon Valley. I love engineers. I love working together on problems. We're all a little bit too left brain. We're a little too rational. And I, my experience with teams has been that it's very hard to get them to talk about emotion. Um, now, in, in fairness, full disclosure, my mom is a clinical psychologist. Um, I grew up being very comfortable talking about emotion. Um, but I didn't realize until about 10 years into my career at LinkedIn that it was a fundamental problem that we were too rationally looking at users' needs and not actually talking about the emotions. Marketers, by the way, are also victim to this. I remember early meetings talking with marketers where we only wanted to talk about positive brand attributes, right? Aspirational attributes. This is what our company stands for. This is what our brand stands for. And we weren't open and talking about negative attributes or negative emotions that were involved. So to give a LinkedIn example from back in the day, when you search for a job, there's a lot of emotion. What are the positive emotions? It really comes down in my book to hope. There's this vision of like, what if I get this job? My life will change in some way, right? Maybe my parents will be proud of me. Maybe I'll show them what I can do. Maybe I can change the world. But there's all this positivity of what if, if I get that job? What about the negative side? It's almost always fear, right? Fear that they don't know who you really are, that they won't understand your background, fear that someone else has the inside track. It was only when we got the teams really talking about emotions that then designers and engineers and product managers could do the good work of leveraging that emotion into the design. When we made Apply with LinkedIn a decade ago, it was probably the first feature maybe you looked at on the website where you said like, oh, that isn't totally ugly. Um, but no, fundamentally it's because we were talking about the emotion. We wanted you to see a version of yourself go like, I'd hire that person, that's amazing, to, to trigger that hope and then show you all the people that you know at that company or connected to that company. No, you don't have to worry about someone else having the inside track, you have that inside track. So my experience has been if you can get teams to talk about emotion, that heat, you'll design better software. Um, one last piece of advice here is do look for those magic moments. Not to repeat myself on surprise, but fundamentally, you will see when you show designs to people, if they respond to something, a moment where they get it, you want to not only find those magic moments in your software, but you want to greatly reduce the amount of time it takes a person to see it. In a perfect world, they would get to your software, and within a click, they'd have this magic aha moment, and it wouldn't just be rational. It would be emotional. So the third one is pretty easy, um, and this has become kind of a staple, so everyone knows this already, I know. Simple, simple is hard. I, I, I blame Steve uh, Jobs a little bit for this. Like, he really did a great job of evangelizing this idea of simplicity being difficult and having value by itself. Right, less is more, we all know from design, white space actually shapes how you visualize things. We know this, and yet we keep crowding our products with too many features. We keep crowding every pixel of space with information. And by the way, no one gets a, a pass. Like I know these days you can just make the web page scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and everyone loves it. It's no good either, right? <laughs> like we just cram too much into one thing. It's easier than making the hard decision of what to include and what not to include. This is why I loved mobile when it came out, right? Not just because I had a bias towards apps, but because mobile forced people to say, wow, this screen, was, it was really small, now it's huge, but it was really small and forced you kind of like email to say like, if I only wanted the user to do one thing here, what's that one thing? 
And then by the way, everything else that distracted from that one thing was probably a mistake. And the web is really hard to recover from. It's just too easy to add more into it. And unfortunately, with smartphones getting bigger, we've actually fallen into some of the same traps. Um, I will take a moment, though, to talk about Einstein's razor. Um, for those of you who had science backgrounds in the room, you probably remember Occam's razor. Occam's razor is that basic scientific principle. It's not a law, but just a principle. You have two things that could explain an outcome. And if they can both predict the outcome, take the one that's simpler. And that makes a lot of sense in science because you're kind of building a pyramid, and if any part of the pyramid's faulty, the whole thing comes crumbling down. Einstein's razor is a little different, and to paraphrase, it's basically this idea that you want to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And to do this, I want to point to the original iPhone. So back when the iPhone came out, right, the most popular phone was the BlackBerry, and the BlackBerry had inherited that mantle from Nokia phones. Nokia phone had like 12, 13, 14 buttons on it. BlackBerry was like, hold my beer. I could do like 50 buttons. Look at all the buttons. You thought your fingers were too big for this. No, you can press all the buttons. And, and by the way, they were right. I love my BlackBerry. It was amazing. It was so productive. <laughs> Apple comes along and says, okay, flat screen, no tactile. Okay, getting rid of all the buttons. How many buttons we're going to have? But even Apple, when they made the device, kept one button. Why? You think Steve wasn't pedantic about getting rid of buttons? Um, Steve was a lot of things, but he was very, very specific about what he wanted. Why did they keep that home button? It's because they felt that it was important enough to have an interface that you could actually feel without seeing. That there was one button that you could rest your finger on and know you were in the right place. Kind of a home. And they did call it the home button. And so when you have this Einstein's razor, just be careful. Simple can become such a religion with your teams. At some point, you cut away things that actually are too far. And there's judgment involved there. But this idea of Einstein's razor, of making things as simple as possible but not simpler, is a good thing to keep in the back of your head as a product manager. I'll also point out that it's a gift. What else did the iPhone add? Well, they actually added something. They added a switch. Most people don't remember this, but before the iPhone, on almost every device, BlackBerry, Nokia, what would happen if the ringer was on and you had to turn it off, the phone rings? It was like, oh my God. And by the way, the emotional disaster of that, talk about emotion of that ring, so embarrassing. Like it barely ever happens today, but when it does, you like remind it, oh my God. And so they actually, it used to be you had to go into a menu, settings, sound, it was like three levels deep. It was so hard to do. BlackBerry made it slightly easier because you could roll, roll, roll through the three menus, but still super hard. Apple added a switch. So all that work to get rid of all the buttons, and they added something. Why? Because they found the heat. They found a pain point that was so ugly and so emotional. And by simplifying the whole thing, they left room to add something new. And that's really the gift of simplicity, is it frees up real estate to actually focus on the problems that will hit your customers the most. Now, I know Apple has finally gotten rid of the button. It took them more than a decade. Um, and some of us love it, and some of us are still getting used to it. Um, but I always like to think of that original iPhone. If you want that argument of why you don't go to zero on everything, it's because you have to get to that heart of that real user experience and making things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Now, we did this in Dropbox. Um, I do work at Dropbox, I'll just say. And a lot of our effort the last year has been trying to think of how we could create a space for people to get their work done um, and make things as simple as possible. People love Dropbox because of its simplicity and transparency. And one of the dangers of moving to the application world is all of a sudden applications have a user experience. They, by definition, can't be as simple as something that is invisible. So how do you balance that? And we've been pushing the teams to figure out how we can really get rid of the noise in the modern workplace um, and still deliver that simplicity. And we just released our first GA of this. We will keep iterating on to make it better. But I will tell you, we talk about Einstein's razor a lot in these discussions. And I'm always worried, did we find that right balance? And pushing the teams to ask the question of, are we really solving those pain points? The next lesson I want to talk about is obsessing about your non-users. Now, Amazon is famous for building a culture about obsessing about customers. I love obsessing about customers. I am sure that through this day, many people will talk to you about obsessing about your customers, and I will never argue against it. But there's a funny thing that happens as you build software. Data about your customers is relatively easy to get. 
You can call your customers, visit your customers, look at metrics from your customers, all these things about your customers. And pretty soon you discover that you have a company of dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of people, and you can't find anyone who actually spends time talking about your non-customers, your non-users. And yet all of your growth is based on some information about your company, either comes from you or from your customers, touching a non-user and inviting them in. And so few product teams end up thinking about that basic problem of what do they look like to their non-users. Now, LinkedIn, back in the day, we acquired a company called Cardmunch. They had an amazing feature. Business Card Scanner, love this app, big fan of it. Um, and they had a great viral idea, which is that maybe when you scan a business card, that person would get an email automatically with your business card, like to close the loop. It was actually a very nice feature. Now, classic MVP, get it out quickly. They spent all this time on building the feature, make sure the metrics were right. And they kind of hacked together an email that would go out. And I asked a simple question. How many of these emails are going to go out? Oh, they were so proud of themselves. Millions, millions of emails are going to go out. Um, because just uh, people scan business cards, people do it like a lot. I'm like, so you're telling me that we have, at the time, tens of thousands of happy users of this app who will love your app design. And we're going to have millions of people who get an email that literally looks like you designed it like in a half hour at night, because that was true. I'm not, I'm not bad at it, they were fantastic. And they just hadn't thought of it that way. And I reminded them, back in the day, there were companies like Plaxo, et cetera, like your brand very often is about your non-product experiences. Those ads you're running, those viral loops you're so proud of, those emails that go out are not an afterthought. That actually, for most people in most hyper-growth environments, even if you're growing like this, fantastic, that just means that you're touching even more non-users with your brand and with your product, and very few people in your company are probably thinking about that. And so asking the question about your non-user experience, asking what you can do to make that better, is something that's worth spending time on. And so I do believe that growth, I mean, growth obviously comes from your non-users. Marketers know this intrinsically. Teaching your engineering team, your design team, that actually your non-users are important, even if they don't have data on it. We all have biases, and one of the cognitive biases that we have is we tend to focus on the data we have and not ask questions about the data we don't have. And that's very important when you're building a product, especially when you're in growth mode trying to reach more and more people. This next one's a fun one. I'm a parent, and so for those of you in the room who are parents, you might recognize this. For those who are don't, I hope some of you have some arrested development or something you can channel. Maybe you still eat in restaurants with kitty menus. Maybe not. I eat a lot of them, as it turns out. Um, but if you eat at restaurants with kitty menus, very often you get one that has a maze, right? And my seven-year-old daughter will be working on the maze, and sometimes the maze is easy, and sometimes it's frustrating. So what do you do as a parent? You show them that trick you have in your back pocket. Try solving the maze backwards, right? And it sounds so easy and obvious, and we mostly all know this. And yet when we're trying to prioritize a product roadmap, we forget this basic idea of working backwards. And whether you're in a startup or a large established company, a product that's on its third major version or its first, it's amazing how often I see product teams get into heated arguments about whether a feature is a good idea or not. And the problem is in software is a lot of people are smart. And so they can argue anything they want to argue endlessly. And look, it's good to argue if a feature is a good idea or not. There are features that are bad ideas to build. But more often than not, around smart people, a lot of the features are actually good ideas. It's just not the right time to do them, right? And that could be because you're curating a set of features. It could be prioritization. Maybe you need to move numbers. But arguing should you do something when the real debate is when you should do it, I think is fairly toxic for teams. It builds ill will. It's not intellectually honest. And actually doesn't reflect the fact that some things in a successful product will get done. It's just a matter of when. I remember knockdown, drag on fights at LinkedIn back in 2008 around the idea of when we were going to localize LinkedIn into more languages, because at the time it was English only. And we would have these arguments, and people would actually say things like, well, maybe most professionals are using English these days. And, and obviously they didn't really mean that. It's one of those things that people say when they get into arguments. And they're trying to argue instead of the obvious of like, look, obviously if LinkedIn is going to be successful, and reach the world's professionals, we are going to localize in all languages. The question is which languages we do and when. And that's a more productive discussion. That's a more productive debate. You can have debate about resources, debate about money, debate about time, debate about people, expertise, not debating the idea. 
And so I like giving this advice to teams to think backwards from the future. Think of what success looks like. If the answer is that you're going to have this feature in the future, just state that up front as a product leader and frame the debate more about when is the right time to do this feature? How do we prioritize these features for others? Is it a metrics mover? Is it a customer request? Will it delight people? I find these are much more useful questions than the false argument of whether it's a good idea or not. And you will see people on your team slip into the pattern of arguing that the feature's not a good idea, even when they know it's a good idea, they just don't want to do it now, or they think there's a higher priority. And so debating is critical, but it tends to be more objective than debating the if. Debate the when. All right, last one I'm gonna leave you with is I will encourage all of you who are product leaders to know your superpower. I believe that software is a team sport. I used to play team sports. Um, there is no function that exists at your company that doesn't have a good reason. In fact, if you don't think there's a good reason for a function, most likely it's because you haven't worked with someone great at it, in my opinion. And it takes all those skills to be competitive. Because if you don't leverage those skills, believe me, your competitors will. And it will show in the products and services they offer. Um, I didn't do all the functions here, I just gave a subset. The superpower in my belief of product is the power to frame the discussion. And this is really a superpower. You might think that the engineers don't report to you. That's good because they don't, usually. <laughs> Designers don't. Who reports the product anyway? It's amazing how much power it has at all. Um, but the power to frame a discussion, to frame a problem, if I go back, computer science, basic algorithms, how you frame a problem is more than half of how you end up solving a problem. And by the way, if you do a bad job of this, you can really lead a team astray. And that can be strategic, that can be the questions, that can be prioritization, but how you frame the problem will lead a team strongly in a direction. Designers, when I was a designer, designers have this power to visualize. Most human beings can't actually see the solution in their head. And the power that designers have to actually frame a discussion by showing people what could be, even if they're bad ideas in different frames, if anyone has creative exposure, they'll know that even bad ideas can help shape the discussion about what's possible. And that's an amazing superpower. And if designers aren't leveraging that power, they're missing out on a leadership opportunity. And then of course engineers, I mean, when I left engineering, this is when I felt greatly. There are so many debates at technology companies about whether something is or isn't possible. And the fantastic thing about being an engineer is you can take that argument completely off the table, right? Because you know what can and can't be done and you can actually demonstrate this. And so these are superpowers. They're just examples, there are more powers. But know whatever function you're in, know your superpower. And make sure as a team leader that you're leveraging all those powers to get to the best answer. If you see designers on your team, engineers on your team, marketers on your team not leveraging that superpower, that's the type of leadership feedback that can get a team to better results. So listen, final thoughts. Um, I want to be careful on time. Um, I tend to run over, as it turns out. Um, I will say, as a product leader for 20 years, it's just a fact. We tend to be our own harshest critics. We know every feature we wanted to build that got cut, everything that didn't quite come out to spec, everything that should have been one way but didn't quite come out that way. We know every corner, every nook, every flaw. Um, it's part of it. It's just part of it. Um, the good news is products are never done and there's always the next turn of the crank. But try to be a little easier on yourself sometimes. Your customers, your users deserve perfection, but it's an aspirational goal. You'll never get there, and it can hold you back. Um, I do believe that behaviors matter, values matter. These questions about the emotion are not just tactics to get to the right answer, in my opinion. It's about how you behave as a leader and how you value your team and how you even frame the problem includes the behaviors and the values that you lead a team with. I do believe that we're always learning, and we have to. Technology keeps changing, our customers keep changing, right? Everything keeps changing. And so even if you came up with the perfect answer, and by the way, you didn't, but even if you did, the right answer next year would be a different answer anyway. And so you have to be constantly in a growth mindset. So I do want to encourage everyone here to aspire to be a great product leader. And I want to thank you for taking a half hour to listen to uh, some of the lessons from my career. Thank you.